Καλησπέρα σας. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ήρθατε στο Εθνικό Ίδρυμα Ερευνών. Ε, και σας καλωσορίζουμε στη σημερινή διάλεξη του καθηγητή κοινωνιολογίας, κ. Τζον Evans, η οποία πραγματοποιείται στο πλαίσιο του ερευνητικού προγράμματος «Science and Orthodoxy Around the World» «Επιστήμες και Ορθοδοξία ανά τον κόσμο» του Ινστιτούτου Ιστορικών Ερευνών του Εθνικού Ιδρύματος Ερευνών. Το ερευνητικό αυτό πρόγραμμα, με ακρονίμιο SOW, εστιάζει στον διάλογο μεταξύ επιστήμης και θρησκείας στον ορθόδοξο χριστιανικό κόσμο. Συμμετέχουν πάνω από 50 ειδικοί από 15 χώρες και από διάφορα ερευνητικά πεδία, από τις θετικές επιστήμες και τη φιλοσοφία, μέχρι την ιστορία, τη θεολογία και την εκπαίδευση. Απευθύνεται σε όλους τους ερευνητές των σχετικών πεδίων, τους μετρητές των σχέσεων επιστήμων και θρησκείας σε όλο τον κόσμο, καθώς και σε ένα ευρύτερο κοινό που ενδιαφέρεται για ζητήματα που ανακύπτουν από τις σχέσεις των επιστημών με τη θρησκευτική πίστη. Σκοπός του ΣΟΟ είναι η εδραίωση διεθνώς μιας μόνιμης πλατφόρμας διαλόγου μεταξύ επιστημόνων και ορθόδοξων διανοητών, ο οποίος διάλογος, αν και υφίσταται ως ένα βαθμό, δεν είναι ιδιαίτερα εμφανή σε ένα διεθνές επίπεδο. Στοχεύει επίση το να φέρει τον Ορθόδοξο κόσμο στο προσκήνιο τη διεθνού έρευνα των σχέσεων επιστημών και θρησκεία. Τέλο, στοχεύει και στη συλλογή, καταγραφή και ανάδειξη των απόψεων και θέσεων που συγκροτούν σήμερα τον διάλογο αυτό στην Ελλάδα, τη Ρωσία, την Ουκρανία, τη Ρουμανία, τη Βουλγαρία, τη Σερβία και τη Γεωργία, αλλά και στο Ηνωμένο Βασίλειο, τι Ηνωμένε Πολιτείε τη Αμερική, τη Γαλλία και την Αυστραλία μέσα από μια εξειδικευμένη βάση δεδομένων, ανοιχτή πρόσβασης, καθώς και ένα σύνολο προσωπικών συνεντεύξεων. Ως προς τον σημερινό ομιλητή μας, ο Τζον Έβανς είναι καθηγητής κοινωνιολογίας και αναπληρωτής κοσμήτορ της Σχολής Κοινωνικών Επιστημών του UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Έχει διατελέσει επισκέψη ερευνητή στο Institute for Advanced Studies του Πανεπιστημίου Princeton, Μεταδιδακτορικός ερευνητής στο Πανεπιστήμιο Yale και επισκέπτης καθηγητής στα Πανεπιστήμια του Edinburgh και του Münster. Η έρευνά του εστιάζει στο δημόσιο διάλογο θρησκείας και επιστήμης με έμφαση στα ζητήματα ανθρωπισμού και ηθικής και με τη χρήση μεθοδολογικών εργαλείων των κοινωνικών επιστήμων. Είναι συγγραφέας δύο μονογραφιών σχετικά με την ιστορία και την φύση της βιοηθικής, δύο μονογραφιών για τις κοινωνικές απόψεις γύρω από τη βιοτεχνολογία, ενώ έχει δημοσιεύσει πάνω από 45 άρθρα σε περιοδικά και σύμικτους τόμους σχετικά με ζητήματα που αφορούν τη θρησκεία, την επιστήμη και τον δημόσιο διάλογο. Το πιο πρόσφατο βιβλίο του έχει τίτλο «What's a human? What the answers mean for human rights?» «Πώς ορίζεται ένας άνθρωπος?» «Η απαντήσει στο ερώτημα και η σημασία τους για τα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα» που το εξέδωσε το Oxford University Press φέτος. Η σημερινή του διάλεξη, η οποία βασίζεται στο πρόσφατο αυτό βιβλίο, έχει τίτλο «What's a human? The American Public's Views and the Impact on Human Rights» στα ελληνικά «Πώς ορίζεται ένας άνθρωπος, οι απόψεις της αμερικανικής κοινής γνώμης και ο αντίκτυπός τους στα ανθρώπινα δικαιώματα». Τζον, έχεις το φλόγο. Ευχαριστώ Thank you very much, Themios, uh, for that introduction. And I will now have a, a new request of all people who introduce me in the future that they do so in Greek, because I truly have no idea what you said. And I, in the past, have been embarrassed by people making these claims about me. But um, for all you, for all I know, you said the idiot from California is here. So uh, thank you. I have a new request of everyone. And thank you very much for having me here, uh, my first time in Greece. And I have enjoyed myself. Uh, immensely in the hospitality of uh, Themios and the others involved with the Orthodoxy Around the World project. Uh, the structure of my talk this afternoon is probably not very wise. I'm going to try to summarize two-thirds of this forthcoming book, which is a lot of material, but I think it's easier to understand if you see most of it all at once. And the question is what it means to be human which I consider to be one of the central, longest-lasting question in intellectual thought. You can see it in various terms throughout intellectual traditions. Marx was concerned with the uh, dehumanization uh, involved with certain forms of labor. The 
Uh, Christian tradition has a version. I would argue the entire humanistic tradition is ultimately about this question. And following the theological terminology of this, I will call these senses of what a human is anthropologies. Now, I don't mean by this the discipline of anthropology. The discipline of anthropology got its name from the fact that it used to focus on what is a human. I instead mean what humans are. I also want to clarify that unlike almost all of the people who talk about what is a human, I'm not going to make a claim of what a human truly is. Sociologists generally don't make that claim. I'm going to talk about what people think a human is and the relationship of thinking a human is a particular way to human rights. And there's multiple claims in the public sphere that believing in a particular version of the human, a particular type of anthropology, leads people to treat each other in a certain way, independent of what the true human really is. And the most common claim that I'll be trying to evaluate tonight is that um, when a critic says someone holds the wrong anthropology, that that's the not the true human, that that will lead to inhumane treatment. We will treat each other worse because we're thinking of the human incorrectly. The, the most obvious version of this is, as it's been demonstrated repeatedly, that it's easier for governments to have wars and genocides if they first define the people who are going to be acted against as not fully human, which has been demonstrated, obviously, many times. A second thing to be clear about, I will make a distinction between what I'll call contested humans and uncontested humans. An uncontested human is that which all the dominant anthropologies agree, that's a human. Okay, you, you, me, the person on the street. I'm not going to talk about directly contested humans like fetuses, uh, un unconscious people, dolphins, chimpanzees. Uh, these are contested, and not all the anthropologies see these as humans. I'm interested, I'm not really interested that in some anthropologies, if you define embryos uh, as not human, then people will destroy embryos. It seems incredibly obvious. That's not the challenging question in at least the American tradition. Rather, the question is, how someone defines one of these uncontested humans, does that impact how we would act towards them? Does it in ever so slightly a way make us treat each other worse? So a person that many people know who is a contributor to this debate is British biologist Richard Dawkins. He's um, one of the most strongest defenders of Darwin. And he's also the vice president of the British Humanist Association, which is a defender of human rights. So he has been accused by a journalist of exactly what critics say about him, which is that because he believes that humans are defined purely biologically, then, we must, then he must believe, this journalist said, that we should treat people like biological objects. Then Dawkins claims that his biological definition of the human has no effect on his social views. He said that no self-respecting person would want to live in a society that operates according to Darwinian laws. I'm a passionate Darwinist when it comes to explaining the development of life, what we ourselves are. However, I'm a passionate anti-Darwinist when it involves the kind of society in which we want to live. A Darwinian state would be a fascist state. So another way to describe this whole project is that I'm testing whether or not the humanistic Dawkins is actually representative of the US public. Do Americans who believe in this Dawkins version biological de definition of the human, would they treat people with human rights? So this, believe it or not, is what I will cover in not too long. And the entire talk is set up as a comparison between these academic claims about anthropologies and the anthropologies that the general public actually uses. So I'll start with a brief outline of the academic debates about whether holding particular anthropologies leads to less support for human rights. Then I test these claims in the US using a survey. Then I show the extent to which the public agrees with these. 
and show evidence from interviews about the anthropology that the public uses uh, without my creating these words for them on a survey. Imagine it's like you ask the public to use their own words instead of me, the academic, defining it for them. I'll argue that there's two different stories here. There's one story about if the academics define the human and another one if you just let Americans' views come up naturally on their own. So whenever you see the red in an outline, that means that's where I am. So if you kind of lose track of me and you get to see another outline, the red is where I am. So I'm essentially testing the claims of humanist thinkers about the influence of the public believing in the wrong anthropology. And most notably, there's this competition among scholars and activists to get people to accept one of three general definitions of the human, the theological, the philosophical, and the biological. So let me just briefly sketch these for you, because these will be the main categories I use. And I'll start with the theological definition. In the United States, this means the Christian definition. It also means sort of a compromised position between the Catholic and Protestant positions. Um, as it has been Christians of various sorts who've dominated the public sphere since the beginning. And I think everyone's familiar with this idea, uh, but it all starts with this idea that God made humans in the image of God. So I won't read this uh, for you, but um, not only in this idea are humans made in the image of God, and that's the definition of a human, that which is made in the image of God. They're special because God made them this way, uh, and only humans are given this uh, power. They're special compared to other animals. And the final piece is that God made every human essentially one by one, and therefore, this idea continues, each human is then loved by God. So that is the general idea that many Americans and certain types of academics hold about what a human is. But then how is this related to how you would treat each other? So it's claimed by the proponents of this that someone who believes in this anthropology will look at another person and see something different that they would if they held one of the other ones. They would see someone with this separable, true, unchanging soul that the soul not only means that you're made in this image of God, but that you're at least capable of a communication with God. So Post, who's a theologian in America, writes, the purported moral significance of having an immaterial, immortal soul is that it ensures the moral commitment of a good society to protect all human beings based on their varied and unre unreliable capacities, but on the basis of basic human equality. And I will just gesture, I don't have time to to uh, discuss this in detail, but the secular human rights tradition is usually thought to be a sort of secular translation of this idea. Individuals have dignity due to this, but starting in the Enlightenment and moving forward, people wanted to find a secular way of saying something similar. But in the West, the people who talk about this most are these human rights theorists um, who claim that human rights cannot be justified without a sacred human, and the best avenue towards creating the idea of a sacred human is that they're made in the image of God. And so here's how uh, Grace Cow uh, describes this. Basically, since everyone's created in the image of God, uh, this creates certain moral conduct from us, uh, minim minimally abstaining from potentially harmful activities such as theft and murder, et cetera. And so, this is the claim made. So if you go to America and talk to academics, they'll say, if you believe that humans are made in the image of God, you will treat other humans in this particular way. And then there's a secular translation of that in human rights discourse. What I'm calling the philosophical definition of the human is technically, if there's any philosophers in the room, I will apologize for being vague here. Philosophers are technically concerned about persons and not humans, but it's not an important difference for me. Um, the question is, the human embryo is obviously genetically human, but the question is, does it have the capacities that make it fully human? And the conclusion in the West has largely been it doesn't have rationality, 
uh, foresight, et cetera, and therefore doesn't reach this criteria. Um, moreover, human or persons might include what we would consider animals like chimpanzees and animals that have certain capacities like we humans have. There's a debate about, in some countries, whether or not chimpanzees uh, deserve human rights, for example. Um, so just to give you just an example, you don't need to read. This is one influential philosopher's list of the capacities that make you human. So if you were to have all of these traits or capacities, you would be a human. Just the, some of the highlights, consciousness, preferences, conscious desires, and so on and so forth. So, this is just one set of lists. If we, the, uh, you went to a philosophy conference, they would debate the content of this list. But what's important for, not, for me is not the content of this list, but there is a list. That the whole premise of this is that there are some capacities, whatever they are, and those are what make you human. So, critics of this say that uh, it will influence the treatment of uncontested humans. They claim that people will hold this anthropology will see humans as a matter of degree, not as an absolute, but that the more of these capacities you have, the more you would be treated better. Okay? And they would point out that this was the basic reasoning of the eugenics movement, that people with more of these capacities have more value some somehow. Critics are also concerned that we will treat humans more like we treat animals because this tradition, there is no bright line between animals and humans. It only matters what capacities the various entities have. So again, uh, most famously, Peter Singer, who's a philosopher in this tradition, has said that uh, chimpanzees should have more rights or more right to life than newborn human babies because newborn human babies really don't have any of these capacities. And so if you really need to end the life of a newborn human baby, it would be uh, more acceptable. Now I'll turn to the, the big scary tradition in at least America that everyone uh, from all sorts of perspectives is concerned about, which is the rise of a biological anthropology. Uh, many different types of people, social scientists, humanists, uh, and others talk about this in slightly different ways. The theologians are especially fearful of the rise of this um, idea. The idea is that at one time we thought of ourselves as made in the image of God or because we had these human capacities, but now we are defined by a particular DNA sequence. The central feature of this is uh, reductionism, the idea that Darwin explains everything that's important about being human. So the extreme version of this is humans essentially are their genes, that we are essentially a set of genes walking around in this container, is the extreme version of this. Um, so an example of a critic, a critic of this view is Pellegrino, who says that in the biological anthropology, mind, soul, emotion, spirit, all are simply epiphenomena of matter explicable in terms of physics and chemistry. James Watson, who was the, uh, uh, one of the people who described the structure of DNA in 1953 and in America led the Human Genome Project, uh, says that this discovery of the structure, the chemical structure of DNA, put an end to a debate as old as the human species. Does life have a magical, mystical essence, or is it the product of normal phys physical and chemical processes? The intellectual journey that continued with Darwin's insistence that humans are merely modified monkeys had finally focused on the very essence of life. There's nothing special about it. Life is simply a matter of chemistry. So again, at the extreme, life, we humans, is essentially defined as chemistry, okay? We are uh, ultimately a DNA sequence, which is chemistry, and the critics would say, chemicals are an object, like other objects. So one of the sociologists who concerned about this um, says, that what happens is the public is being taught this perspective through scientific discovery and the like. He writes that as putative genes for such things as schizophrenia and the like are publicized, 
the cumulative effect will be the transformation of how we understand ourselves from moral beings whose character and conduct is shaped by culture, social environment, and choice to biological beings whose fate, according to project head James Watson, is in our genes. So the biological anthropology makes humans appear to be more machine-like or object-like, the critics would say. Genes are portrayed as determinative, as having almost a mechanical influence on behavior, and thus eliminating free will. So perhaps most famous in this regard is Richard Dawkins' idea about the selfish gene, which extends reductionism beyond the human body to the genes that control the formation of this body. In this argument, genes are essentially using our human bodies for their purposes of reproducing themselves. We are essentially like epiphenomena of genes themselves. So the critics who are concerned about this, their critic is quite simple, that the more people learn this idea of the human, they'll teach us that we're more like animals and objects, and thus people will treat each other more like we treat animals or we treat objects. So if we are ultimately DNA, and that's the same DNA that plants and animals have, we can be treated accordingly. Or if we are more machine-like, we can be treated like we treat machines. The biological anthropology describes humans as a species with species interests where individuals aren't particularly important. So to use biological metaphors, you know, if a weak individual uh, were to die, it would strengthen the, the group and so forth. And critics point out that that also would not create uh, concern about individuals. So what I want to do in this project is all of these claims from the humanistic tradition, and I'm focused on the American concern about biotechnology for the past 100 or 150 years, in my opinion, they're all empirical claims. They're essentially philosophers and theologians and others saying, I think that if we consider humans a particular way, we'll think of ourselves differently. Well, this is an empirical question that can be evaluated using social science. How would you do this? I will uh, skip the details for you. This is what the book uh, is about. And the green part there is what I will talk about briefly today. Um, the, uh, the reason I included the PhD students is the humanities groups is a comparison group for the biology students and to see whether or not the biology PhD students really have the biological anthropology. If they don't, nobody will. Okay, so all this claim that this idea is spreading if you can't find this view among people getting their PhDs at a major university in California that will remain unnamed, uh, you're not going to find it anywhere. So back to my outline. Um, I wanted to assess this connection between your idea of the human and treatment using a national survey. And the survey is ideal for this because if an effect exists, it's actually going to be small. If it was some large effect, we'd all be aware of it. But it's a small, if it's a small effect, it's thought it would sort of accumulate with time, and you would need a survey to do this. The other is, if you do an interview with someone, they're not going to admit to you, I really think torture is a good idea. Okay? It's just not the thing face-to-face -face people are going to say. And so therefore, you need to have a different methodology. So let me just give a couple examples. Um, so to measure the extent to which people agreed with the biological anthropology, I had these long s descriptions of the human that were described as being from a professor at the university. And this is sort of synopsis of the Dawkins sort of view of the human. Um, and just to briefly, what you see the idea here is to say, you know, we're a type of animal. Uh, we both have DNA, different patterns. We're ultimately similar to other humans. Our gene sequence allows us to dominate the other animals. So this is just overall the, the more extreme version that you could imagine that actually continues to the next page, which is a very long thing, but since this, it's the survey people have in front of it, they can read it. But the point being that it talks about um, how we act is caused more by our genes than our free will. Our genes have programmed us 
to be mostly interested in our own and family well-being. Uh, and I know there's very debates about you know genetic interest in strangers and so on, but this is the core of it. Um, and basically, this is the entire bio biological view in a few paragraphs. And at the end of this whole thing, the respondent is asked, you may agree or disagree with parts of the professor's statement. Do you agree or disagree with the statement overall? And so you can distribute all Americans on the extent to which they agree with this. I also ask people similar sorts of questions about the philosophical and the theological anthropologies, and I'll save time by skipping over, but it's the same idea. Imagine everything I said about the philosophical in a couple of paragraphs, everything I said about the theological in a few paragraphs. So I have a measure of what every American, their attitude towards each one of these ideas of the human, right? Um, so when you look at each one of these, there's a general depiction of the human that comes along with it. And so what I tried to do was to create an extent to which Americans agree with these general depictions. And these are essentially the concerns that academics have about these definitions. So for example, the first one asks the respondent whether or not humans are special. The next one is whether or not, I was going to ask whether or not humans are machines, but most people wouldn't agree that, that was, they would think that sounded silly. So I instead ask if the human mind is like a machine, and you actually get a pretty good distribution on that question. Whether or not humans are unique, and uh, whether or not people uh, have, with better abilities, have more value than those with less abilities. Now, each one of these actually had a pretty big range of the population, people agreeing and disagreeing with each one of these. So, for example, critics would say, those who are taught this biological definition of the human will think that humans are not special, are more like machines, are not unique, and would have different value according to their abilities. That's the academic critique. And the question is, is that true? Is that true among Americans? The Americans who think in these biological terms, do they think of humans as in these particular ways? But more importantly, I wanted to talk about how we treat each other. So I asked a series of questions that are essentially trade-offs about what are typically called human rights questions. Again, you can't just ask people, do you think we should go torture people? everyone would say, no, you can't torture people. But if you give people a seemingly reasonable trade-off here, this is essentially a human rights perspective versus a utilitarian. And so the question is, um, should you put military at risk to stop a genocide in Eastern Europe? Would you buy a kidney from a poor person uh, so there's a benefit, that, so your child would benefit, but should you really buy organs from people? Uh, these are thought to be, again, related because if you think of organs, human body organs, as for sale, that's supposed to be indicative of thinking of a human body as more like an object or a machine. And if you think of humans as objects or machines, the critics would say you're more likely to think it's okay to sell parts of yourself. And other questions about torture, uh, taking blood against people's will, and so forth. So, I use various statistics, which I'll just sort of gesture to like this and then stop and not tell you any more. Um, and this is a summary of what you find. Negative means negative relationship and positive means positive. So, and the number of signs is like strength. So, for example, the first box here means, those are negative signs, I hope you can see those, that people who believe the biological human are really unlikely to think that humans are special compared to animals, and really unlikely to think that humans are e have equal value, and they're somewhat unlikely to think that humans are unique, but they're really likely to think they're like machines. People with a theological view, it's a little less uh, consistent, but with the theological notion, notion of the human, they're likely to think that humans are special and unique, but it doesn't really have an effect on your view of machine-like nature. But this philosophical, where you're, you're a compilation of capacities, the people who think of humans as compilations of traits or capacities are very unlikely to think that they're special, very unlikely to think they have equal value, 
very unlikely to think they're unique, but pretty likely to think they're like machines. So, so far, the critics seem to be onto something here. The critics seem to be um, correct. But, um, what about human rights? So the people who believe in the biological definition are less likely to want to stop genocides, more likely to buy kidneys, think suicide to save money is okay, take blood from prisoners without their permission. Again, the theological doesn't really have too much of an effect. It's sort of inconsistent. But in the, the people who have this philosophical definition are less likely to stop genocide, more likely to say we can buy kidneys from poor people, suicide to save money, and torture people uh, to potentially save lives. So the debate about how having the wrong definition of the human has been going on for well over a century. So if you go back to the debates about Darwin in the 1860s, people were saying essentially this. They were saying if we think of the human in Darwin's biological terms, we will think of humans more like animals and we will treat each other differently. But no one's ever really empirically examined whether this is true. And there seems to be evidence um, that uh, this is true. Uh, and this is a claim made by uh, you know, the current or the previous pope. All these papal encyclicals are essentially about this, that if you think of humans as capacities, we'll treat them like objects. There's a neo-Marxist tradition of talking this way. Feminists, humanists, uh, sociologists love to talk this way, bioethicists, and so on. But there seems to be uh, evidence that these people's concerns are right. But um, before people think, I mean, I, I know that my country is giving you a lot of reasons to be concerned right now. You know, with our current presidential election, you should all be very concerned. And before you take this as yet another reason to be deeply concerned about my country, I will soften it a little bit for you, which is you have to look at this one, which is this is the percentage of people who agree with these. I say the more you agree, you tend to have these views of things. But the point being that um, not many people are strong advocates of the biological anthropology. Many people in America believe this theological one. I think America is a very uh, much more religious country than most other countries in the West. But very few people agree with this strong version of this philosophical one. And so what it turns out is that these people who you could call extremists, you should worry about them if you are this defender of human rights. But there's not that many of them, OK? So the lesson is, uh, as one critic put it, if we had uh, Richard Dawkins and Peter Singer have a direct avenue into the minds of all Americans, uh, we should be concerned. But what do you do if you let Americans tell you themselves what they think a human is, not having me define it for them, but let them tell me what they think? And the perspective is a bit more um, reassuring, at least according to my view of human rights. So, what I want to talk about is the public's, starting with the public's definition of the humans, okay? So, I found, first of all, when you try to do a survey uh, interview like this, if you come to someone with a microphone in hand and say, my first question is, what is a human? They just look at you, and they have no way of talking about this. It's just too direct. So instead, you need to ask them about related questions, and then you can figure out, by the end of your conversation, what they think a human is. So I asked them a number of questions about, just to show these quickly, about whether you ch could kill a chimpanzee to save a human. Why? When you say why, you usually get some notion of a difference with a human. How about computers? Why isn't a computer human? You'll get a part of an answer there. Creating super strong, intelligent babies, uh, et cetera. Whether you could create hybrid primate humans, cloning, and whether you should keep people alive who are 
permanently unconscious. So by the time you ask people about this, you will have a pretty good sense of their view of what a human being is. So um, what I want to talk about in my remaining time here is, first of all, when people use biology, when you let them talk on their own, what is the biological definition of the human that they actually come up with? The basic idea here is that when academics define these things, they start with a higher level principle, like there's DNA, and humans, because we have human DNA, we fit into the category. It turns out, when you ask regular citizens about things, they don't reason in that way. They look for analogies or equal cases. Uh, it's called casuistry in English. It's also what Western law, at least, is based upon, which is, can you make an analogy to an equivalent case? And if you can, that's called a precedent, and then that's what you do. So it turns out, in biology, that when you ask a regular person who is a human, they look for the closest case they can find of a human, and where do they find it? In themselves. They think, well, I know I'm a human, and what are the things that make me human? They think to themselves, I have two arms, two legs, I have a shape like this, and so on and so forth. We, I have two human parents. I was born in a particular way. So just a quick interview with this person named Jerry here. So I asked her, is it OK to kill the chimp to save the human? And she said, it's OK if it's a really good cause. And she didn't think the computer would be me because it doesn't have thought processes. That doesn't tell me much yet. But when she starts talking about enhanced babies, this analogy version of the biological comes out. She didn't think about, oh, is it made in the image of God? She didn't debate whether or not it has certain capacities. Instead, she wanted to know whether it had the same experience that she had. How was it created? Did it, they just take an embryo and change it? If so, I think it would still be human because of the way it was created that's why I asked, because I was wondering if it was a Petri dish creation. In other words, if the baby was made like her, coming out of a woman's body in her mind, then it was human. If it started as an embryo that was growing, an offspring of two human like she was. For whether you could change an embryo so much that it would no longer be human, she said no, unless you change the construction of humans, like if you were to change the way we look, or maybe the change we act, because I feel humans have a similar way of processing and thinking or just physical appearance. So this is actually tautological, circular reasoning. She's saying a human is that which looks like a human. It seems to require a definition of the human first. But again, in public reasoning, this is not a problem. This is essentially how law works. It's tautological. Do you, can you identify a case that's the same of it? If so, that's what you do. Catholic ethics works in a similar um, way. So is about the monkey human, which uh, one person uh, called a chuman, a chimpanzee human. She decided to relabel these chumans. And it was also pointed out today that maybe we should call these human Zs. But whatever such a hypothetical entity would be called, what would we do with them? Well, she says, um, it's a whole new thing. It's a new creation of species. And here she actually reaches to the scientific definition of speciation. Well, can it mate with uh, someone else? So this is to point out people are not pure in their thoughts. This is important to remember when you interview the public. Only academics are rewarded for having ironclad, logical, uh, argumentative structures. Regular citizens are not rewarded for this, and they don't. Okay? So she's using a bit of this academic thing she remembers from ninth grade. But her impulses are not to continue down that path. So we ask about the comatose person. And this is refers, a reference to this. Terry Schiavo is a woman in Florida who was unconscious. And there was a large legal battle about whether or not you could end, stop feeding her. And so a lot of Americans will talk about this as an exemplar case to compare to. And she says, uh, well, yes, they're human. 
Because they're still people, I would say that they're human, but they're not living a typical life. Ter uh, I said, well, why was Terry Schiavo still a human in her state? And this woman said to me, she had a normal life ahead of time that she was human, and then that part of her life stopped. So she had a normal life, she lived and had family and whatnot, and then since she couldn't continue, well, she's still human. Okay? Well, this means if you were once human, you're always human. Okay? And again, that's how regular Americans think about this, like, well, I was once human, five years ago I was human, and therefore I'm still human. It doesn't appeal to these higher level deductive principles. So in the, finally, in the response about the clone, she says, uh, she reveals here how the similarity of the human body is the critical thing for her. A clone wouldn't be human because if you create it outside of the body, I guess I wouldn't consider it necessarily human. The fact that it's not even taking place inside a body, inside a normal process, I feel like it's fiddling with the system, but I think the process has been completely removed from the parents, it's unnatural, I guess. So again, if, the, if a clone, I mean, she doesn't know anything about cloning here, right? But if it was born the regular way, then that would be, in her mind, human. So I ask her, how about a summary? So tell me, you've been talking about this for the past 30 minutes. What's a human? And she says, a human is, can I just say, what a human looks? I don't know how to describe it. Someone who walks on two legs and has the same two legs. Well, then they get reluctant because they think, well, what about someone who's missing a leg? They don't want to say that. But then they revert back to these uh, ideas that humans are those who look like us humans. So my final one I want to talk about is how the regular people use capacities, which is different than the academic debate. Um, and there's two different types of traits. What I call autonomous, not dependent on others, and social. The autonomous ones are ones that an entity could have regardless of any interaction with others. It would be like traits you could have if you spent your whole life in a box and never interacted with someone else. You could still have rationality, foresight, and so on. Even if you never encountered another human, you could have these. And if you look at the list from the philosophers, all of their important capacities are these autonomous, you could be living in a box sort of things. Ability to think of the future, rationality, uh, so on and so forth. Well, the public, although sometimes using these sorts of things, has a tendency to try to find another type of traits, they, such as uh, things like ability to show love, compassion, empathy, having feelings, emotions, communication with others. Now, these are sometimes on the philosopher's lists, but these are capacities that are important for social interaction. Ability to have love isn't really relevant if you live in a box and never talk to anyone else. So let me just briefly go through one of my interviews with this person named Sam. The first question, should we kill a chimpanzee to save humans? And he says, yes, kill the chimp, because we're superior to them. And he lists this series of capacities. He says, anything can be a measure of excellence, like the excellence of a human would be our ability to show compassion, our ability for critical thinking, problem solving. So he's got some of these autonomous traits, but he moves towards these social ones. In the case of the enhanced baby, he speculates that there's this idea that if you have some, uh, lacking some things, you would have super abilities in the other. Um, so like blind people supposedly becoming stronger in their other senses, he thinks that if you were already super strong or super bright, you wouldn't need other things. He's worried that the ba baby might lose something else, like the ability to love, maybe their ability to feel emotions, because they're so smart that they're completely rational and logical. So a good novel would be wasted on them. Uh, you know there's no benefit in it. The color of humanity is a gray scale for them. So like others who focus on social traits, he implies that if an entity had too much of these autonomous traits, you were too smart, too rational, whatever, you wouldn't be fully human because you didn't have these social uh, capacities. He, this guy kind of thinks he's a bit of a comedian when he talks. He is actually kind of funny after reading these interviews for months on end. He says about the zygote, uh, well, the initial zygote 
When it's just a lump of cells, it's not human. It can't say, I love you. It can't do things like that. So to him, this idea of human is the ability to express emotion between people. Someone focused on autonomous traits would say something like, an embryo lacks consciousness. But someone who's focused on social traits would say, an embryo can't say, I love you. He later concludes that personhood means all the capacities for being human, which include ability to reason with each other, so that's this autonomous one, with our environment, have relationships, have language, and fall in love. So um, in the future, if he gets into some conversation about the human, clearly he's going to emphasize both these autonomous and these social traits. So. What do we learn from the public when they get to talk in their own language? So earlier I said that if the proponents of the biological and philosophical anthropologies as the academics define them had gained access to the minds of all Americans, then Americans would presumably be a little bit less supportive of human rights. Uh, you know, the image that the critics have is that everyone reads Richard Dawkins' description of the biological machine and then we'd come to think that we're all more like objects and then treat each other as such. However, those anthropologies are not commonly held by the American public and they hold variants of these biological and capacities, but they are ones that I think people should be a lot less worried about. And my reasons are, for the biological one, the academic version is thought to create less support for human rights because we become like objects, right? Well, for the public one, this doesn't seem likely. Instead, when we, if we were to find some other human by our biological criteria, they become more like us. And if you are defining some other entity as more like you, it's unlikely that you would be maltreating them. It would actually create sort of a form of empathy instead of some sort of distancing like they're an object and I'm not. This public philosophical, these capacities are also, I think, less worrisome about human rights. Think about the dystopian stories of the brave new world, or has anyone seen this movie called Gattaca? Um, to say nothing of the European eugenic experience from the early 20th century forward, these are societies based upon the autonomous traits. They sort societies by your intelligence and things like this. You don't create eugenic societies trying to maximize love, okay? So if you define humans by these interactional qualities, it doesn't seem to lead to uh, discrimination and the like. Moreover, if you are the one judging someone else, you're trying to decide how to treat some other person, and you've defined the human yourself as one who shows love, compassion, uh, interactive ability, again, that's not likely to lead you to think, oh, because I'm a human, I too am a human who thinks about love that you're going to maltreat uh, somebody else. So somehow this uh, philosophical notion of the humans that Americans will tell you on their own when you don't define it for them is a, a little bit less worrying about this concern about human rights that the critics have long had. So that was a lot, but I think I need to re-summarize uh, what I'm saying here. First, the biological and philosophical anthropologies as defined by this academic debate are associated with, in the American public with thinking of humans as more object-like. The biological and philosophical anthropologies, again, as defined by the academics, are associated in the American public with thinking it's acceptable to buy kidneys, commit suicide to save money, and not stop genocide. The biological is also associated with taking blood from prisoners without their permission, and the philosophical agreeing, be more likely to agree to torture. But few members of the American public agree with these academic versions, these sort of extreme versions that are out there. So while the critics should remain vigilant, their nightmare, nightmare scenario is not currently happening. And the anthropologies that the public does use on its own currently include in the biological and philosophical version, but they're different 
from the academic versions. And I would argue that these definitions are different enough that they're unlikely to have the same negative effects on human rights. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk and the conclusions <laughs> and the presentation. Uh, we are open to question, debate, and... I have a question. Uh, just uh, to question, debate, and... Uh, my name is Greg Spiliopoulos. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice. It was very fruitful that time I spent here listening to you. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, even though I'm a mathematician, I'm outside of your area of expertise. Uh, it's a very interesting subject. And uh, the first thing came coming in my mind uh, while I was listening to you was that human rights is something that is given by some low, uh, uh, how can I express, somebody who has the power, uh, enforces the law, and gives you the rights. It's not something you have it. It's something you earn it. It's something that is given to you. Therefore, I was wondering why you didn't took under consideration the laws, the law part you, 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 you discussed about biological approach, by philosophical approach, uh, by uh, you, talk about, uh, you talked about uh, religion approach, not about the law approach. And the law approach, I believe, in around the world gives a lot of information for all of the, th the th previous three, meaning um, what is a dead body, has rights, the fetus has rights, you, t you talked about that, but the law in, in your country, for example, in the United States, uh, that is coming from, uh, from the public, it's not a law of uh, codes as it is in Europe, answers some stuff like this and probably gets into, into, into the mind of the lawmaker what the public opinion believes. In Europe, we have the codes. And uh, the public opinion is coming to agree with the codes and, not, is ma and, and is not making the law. I don't know, it's a very complicating thing that I'm trying to, to talk about and uh, I'm not a sociologist yeah. or a religion. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it's a good point. So, I mean, I yeah, see two uh, different... Uh, 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 so, the point is, uh, do you believe that the laws are uh, formed uh, taking under consideration what the public believes, are forming the public's opinion, and uh, finally, uh, do you believe that this is something, that this is an ongoing procedure that is changing all the time and yeah. maybe is gonna lead somewhere differently than we really yeah. Yes, uh, so I think there's two moments in this. One is, I do think that human rights law it was originally justified by some idea of a sacred individual. And that was, it. but what's become in Europe is it's become a useful generalization that many people for many reasons can agree to. And so it doesn't have the specific context, or specific content in the law as much. However, I think you're entirely right that law doesn't just control people, it teaches them something. And so, if you see, you know, in the German constitution, it has the word dignity. You can ask 100 German academics what that means, and they'll tell you 100 different answers, okay? But uh, I think that there's something about that law that teaches the public something else. And so I think that is a mechanism by which people learn these sorts of ideas. Humans have dignity. Now that is very fuzzy, but it does tell you something about it. Does, it definitely doesn't mean that humans are objects. It's something opposite to that. In the American context, 
how would I put this? Americans don't have human rights in this sense. I mean, we've not agreed to these treaties and the like. And so I'm interested in the American context in the sort of um, thought processes that would lead to such things. I think in the Europe, this is one of the differences you would find in, in Europe, especially in the, the part of Europe that's uh, been focused on the human rights since the Declaration of the United Nations and the like. Again, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a methodological question, let's yeah. say. One of your uh, questions was uh, more or less, should we send the army to stop a genocide in Eastern Europe? Yeah. I was wondering whether in the background of uh, recent American politics, that led to, to political biases coming into the discussion because as far as I know, there has been a lot of discussion within the American politics, quite afar from what constitutes a human, whether American politics should be interventionist or not. Yeah. Did you uh, discover any biases related to that, or do you think that it would to go both ways so it doesn't affect it? Well, in, in, you know, the thing about social science is that there's no one obvious answer. And so once you re reach a methodological conundrum, social science is inductive enough that you'll often change the question that you're asking. Um, and so one of the problems in pre-testing the survey where you give it to small numbers of people to see if they even understand the questions, the original question was stopping a genocide in Africa. And then I realized that Americans don't care about Africans, okay? There's a sort of generalized racial thing. And so I thought I could also pick Western Europe or Eastern Europe and I tried to find something that race wouldn't be um, race wouldn't be a factor in how people responded, yet they wouldn't think of it as a country that's sort of just like if I asked about England, for example, it would that would be too much like them. And so I thought Eastern Europe is different enough. There's no uh, there's definitely no answer mag magic answer here. And so I think you know uh, you're definitely there's some bias no matter which way you ask this. Uh, I should also say the one thing that I didn't get a chance to mention is that in a certain utilitarian tradition, all of these questions, the other answer is the correct one. The answer of should you sell organs, the answer is yes, absolutely. You will save more people. Should you torture people to save others? Yes, absolutely. You know, so this is from a certain perspective of the, the power of the of the human rights tradition of the individual, whereas if I were to go to Britain and find myself a good, solid, utilitarian, Jeremy Bentham utilitarian, they would answer these things and say, um, yeah, the, anything for the greater good, the individual is less important. Uh, you have obviously chosen very difficult and complex topics here. Uh, I would like to know which parts of the American public care about what a human is. Yeah. So uh, that's a really good question. So uh, I have a tendency to be interested in questions that the public at present isn't centrally concerned with but that academics think in a few years they should. Uh, so at present, this isn't a huge part of debate among the public, but that said, um, there are people who if you ask them what a human is, they immediately will tell you, which is uh, certain types of Christians. And they learn a definition of the human in their youth, and they have developed pretty elaborate theories about their human. So they're actually pretty concerned about that. Um, other people are less so. The more educated 
a person is, the more likely they are to be to have a strong version of one of these, which is sort of an indication of interest. Um, people with less education are less interested, and I think that just makes sense in the sense that these are abstract sorts of concerns. So that's the that would be the general observation. But the uh, certain sort of religious person can not only give you a detailed version of this made in the image of God, but make an argument against these other ones. You asked Jerry um, about definition and she uh, went back to her school book mm -hmm. to try to define what she was asked about. The question is, um, what is the role of education and how is the education of younger people today shaped to create a citizen of the future who will possibly change their opinions on these matters? Jerry is obviously an adult. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she had read that book maybe 15 years ago, mm -hmm. probably 20. Mm -hmm. And has that changed? Mm -hmm. And who changes uh, school books, and right. why, right. and on what grounds? Right. So school books in the United States are hugely political. And if you go to school in Texas, you have different school books than in California. So truth is different in Texas than in California. So it's very regional based. So who controls is, is like that. But the more general point being that the critics are concerned that the critics have always been concerned. I mean, back into the 1920s, the debate about Darwin in the United States, if people have heard of the Scopes trial, where there was this, that wasn't about the truth of whether humans, I mean, it was partly about whether the truth of humans evolved from lower life forms. It was primarily about morality. The concern was that if all these kids learn about Darwin, they're all gonna start treating each other like animals. That was the concern. So that's always been the concern. Uh, and the, many of the critics I've talked about here are worried that basically as we reach the biological age where you can genetically engineer qualities into your embryos that you will like, you will think of that embryo as the result of your design. And anything that you create is by definition an object. Okay, so if I design something, that's an object. And so people are long concerned that if people learn this, we will slowly treat each other like objects. Now, that said, from what I find, people have been learning about Darwin everywhere except Texas uh, since the 1950s, okay? So I learned about Darwin, and everyone else did, and it doesn't seem to have negatively impacted uh, their, their views in, in terms of my moral agenda here about human rights. So people are concerned more like that if this more extreme version of biology is taught to kids, that humans are actually not like another type of animal, but are a biological machine. People are concerned that if you teach kids that, they'll start to have this different view. But nobody really knows. I mean, uh, you pointed out something which, uh, there's a reason why no one's done this before, empirically, is it's really, really difficult because there's not even agreement on how to talk about it, let alone then to measurement, measure it. So the question you're asking, I don't really know. But I do know that people are really concerned about that. Academics and intellectuals are concerned about that. I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, comparing with your initial supposition, did you really have big surprises after the survey? Yeah, I was, I was actually, I was surprised that I would find that relationship so, it, that it was so powerful. I could have had one half the cases and found the same thing. Um, I, was, I was surprised that the str people who talk the most about this are the religious academics. And I was surprised to find that their claims seem unsupported. They're not directly wrong, but the po most powerful claim is that if you believe that humans 
are made in the image of God, made one by one, and that God has this communicative path right to you, that if you think of humans like that, how could you ever harm one, right? Uh, how could you ever buy their organs or everything else? And that turns out to not really be true. So I'm not sure what's going on there. That's the part that really surprised me. Is I expected to find that relationship, and I expected to find nothing with the biology and the philosophy. But instead, I find the opposite. And so that was surprising. Yeah. We have some questions. Let's thank our friend. So, uh, John, thank you very much for this and uh, for answering the questions. Thank you. Um, we hope the best travel for your book. Yes. And, yeah, uh, I would say, you know, for every one I sell, I get one dollar from my, dollars, my daughter's college education fund. So <laughs> buy early and buy often is what they would say. <laughs> I'll sell 200, and that will buy her one book in American college. Uh, 19 and 3, uh, 19 and 13, okay. so, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.